the Lord once again. Amen, saints. Just thankful that God woke us up this morning. Amen. It's always going to be in the house of the Lord. Yes, Lord. So, just want to give God the praise this morning and thank you again for another day and how He's brought us through this week. And uh, we're going to sing in our hymns, page 356. Just a closer walk with thee. Amen. 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 356 in your hill. <clears throat> Just a closer walk with thee.
the Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. Yeah, yeah. I say the Lord yeah, yeah. is blessing me right now.
He was known as a worshiper of God and an eminent singer. His name means convener or collector. He was a godly man during the time of his personal struggle, and he became an even more godly man after his encounter outlined in this particular song. The book is an honest confession of a faithful Israelite concerning his own struggle with pain. He was a choir leader. His occupation placed him in constant contact with the children of Israel and with the sanctuary of God, the temple. He was a Levite, the son of Berkiah, and part of the Gershom clan, and one of three chief musicians appointed by David to preside over the song services of the sanctuary. In our day, he would be a praise team leader. Asaph's name has gone down in history as an honored and gifted singer. He was a spiritually minded man, gifted in praise and prophecy, whose impact on his family has lasted down through the centuries. The songs which bear his name connect with his character. They are for the most part devoted to intercession and thanksgiving, and they're filled with warning and destruction. So here in Psalm 73, he returns to the problem which troubled David in Psalm 37, and which puzzled the anonymous author of Psalm 49. It is age long, in this age long problem of the seeming prosperity of the wicked, and the equal uh, vexing parallel problem of the suffering of the godly. Well. In Psalm 37, the emphasis can be summed up in the word wait. Where it says, have patience and have faith and patience. The triumph of the wicked will be uh, short lived. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. In Psalm 49, the emphasis is on the word watch. God says, money is powerless to save, and the advantages it secures are fleeting. In Psalm 73, the emphasis is on worship. Mm -hmm. It's better to have your hand in the hand of God than to have it into the pocketbook of some rich sinner. Yeah. We have so many people, even in today's time, who can be bought and paid for for little or nothing. Wow. Now, we saw that a couple of years ago when we witnessed an election fight that in many cases was bought and paid for with lies and deception of crooked political candidates and people and corporations who bought them along with other countries. But here in the text, the fight has already been fought and won. The psalmist is going back over the problem, but it's no longer troubling to him. He says, truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. The word truly is translated in the Hebrew language as expression, as the expression, after all. In other words, he's saying, after all, God is good to Israel. He prefaces what he's about to say by entering the undisputable evidence that God is good. Yeah. He wants us to understand that whatever appearances there may be to the contrary, that God is good, thereby giving us a summary of his theology. Yeah. If you allow your imagination to work with it, you can imagine his soul is flooded with the assurance of God's faithfulness. Yeah. The enemies of joy, doubt, fear, and confusion have lost the battle. His cup is filled to the brim with certainty about the ultimate outcome of life. He begins his problem with a solution. He says, God is good. Yeah. And then he makes the transition as he gets a glimpse of the wicked. Yeah. He says in verse 2, but as for me, yeah. my feet were almost gone. Right. My steps had well nigh slipped. Well. And what the psalmist is trying to get over is that there was a time in his life that the foundation of his faith seemed to crumble beneath his feet. He was shaken to the core. If you allow me to personalize it for you on a physical level, suppose in the morning you were to go to your doctor for a normal checkup. And after you left the house, you're feeling pretty good. But your doctor announces the disastrous news that in a few days you're going to lose your sight. In a few days you'll lose your hearing. 
Or he tells you that we checked and have discovered that there's a malignant tumor on your brain. We're not sure if it's malignant or benign. Uh, or he may say, we checked in some valves around your heart are closed. We're going to have to do surgery today. You need to tell your family that it's emergency surgery. If your doctor were to share that kind of news with you, it would be difficult for you to measure the amount of stress and strain and anxiety that's on you. And so here we have the psalmist who is walking along life. And suddenly he realizes his spiritual life of faith, which is far more important than his physical life, is losing his grip on God. Well. Here he discovers that Satan has established a stronghold of doubt uh -huh. on the shores of his faith. Uh -huh. He realizes he's under fire with Satan's weapons of doubt, right. of fear, envy, and jealousy. Yes. He's being tossed from side to side by discouragement, delusionment, and disappointment. Yeah. He sees that his feet are almost gone. But yet he exposes his humanity for those of us who are reading the word to view the struggle of his soul. And maybe there's someone here today. You're having a fierce battle with some of life's difficult times. Your faith is being challenged and your feet are slipping. You long to get on stable ground. Perhaps there's someone grappling with the perils and the problems of life. You have a difficulty handling doubt that life brings with it. And it appears to be unfair. Uh, the inconsistency seems to mount up as you look at God and your circumstances. There's a problem you don't want to admit, but it's in your heart. You're having a slippery time. And you need some renewed stability to hold on to your faith. You need some sure-footed faith. We're living in slippery times. Somebody's having slippery times on your job. Yeah. Uh, your faith is being tried. Slippery yeah. times. Somebody's having slippery times at home. Watch it, yeah. Someone else is having slippery times at school. Right. Uh, somebody's having slippery times trying to raise their children or grandchildren. Yeah. While others are having slippery times with their finances. Yeah. Yeah. And these conditions, uh, you got to be careful that you don't resort to the world for answers. Yeah. Well, we're given some understanding in this passage. Notice again, beginning in verse 2, where he says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. Uh, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the wicked. I was foolish. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. Uh, for they're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued by other men. Right. Yeah. Therefore, pride is one around their neck as a chain. Huh. Violence cover them as a garment. Yeah. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. And did you not know that doubt has a way of originating from the observations of life? Yeah. When you step back and look across the landscape of humanity, when you see injustice and inconsistencies and inequities placed upon man, it's very easy sometimes to doubt God. It feeds that age old argument, if God is God, and God is good, then why is there so much evil in the world? It's difficult to look and observe the realities of life and maintain faith in God. When you observe your neighbor who never goes to church, never gives a dime to the Lord's work, and never gives God credit for his or her success. They sleep in on Sunday as you make your way to the house of God. Or perhaps they have their fishing gear on their way to the reservoir or to Brookville Lake for a day of fishing, fun, and food. And here you are going to church three times a week, studying your Bible every day. Your co-worker laughs at the idea of God and criticizes the church. And somehow or another, they seem to prosper more and more. You don't understand it? Right. You're serving God, and day after day, you're sick all the time. You're praising God, and you want your sick mother, your sick father to get well. And you've interceded in their behalf, and seeing things just seem to be getting progressively worse. You need to know that these harsh realities, if you're not careful, can become a seedbed of doubt. Because right now, there's somebody who suffered some kind of loss or some kind of reversal. And you have the nerve to ask the question, where is God? You have a question of nagging doubt. 
And your situation may not be because you doubt the existence of God. Sometimes it just depends on where you are spiritually uh, and you've lost fellowship with him. Right. You know he's there, but you're out of touch. Right. Yeah. I read a story the other day okay. where a husband and wife were riding along in the car. And she started lamenting how close they used to be. Mm -hmm. She said, we used to be so close. and look like there's no fire in our marriage. Oh, no. We used to hold hands. We used to rub and touch knees. Uh, we would sit close and, 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 and what's wrong? I, I don't understand. Well, I take that. And the husband looked over at her as he's driving and he, and then he says, I haven't moved. Y'all missed it. Yeah. She used to sit close to him while he's driving. She the one that moved over. Y'all yeah. oh, that person. He said, I haven't moved. God hasn't moved. We are the one that has screwed over. And now we're complaining about the distance between us and God. If you're not careful, you begin to wonder if God really cares about what's going on in your life. You need to know that you're in good biblical company. You're not the first to question God. Habakkuk asked the question, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And how long will you not hear? Yeah. Oh God, why aren't you so silent when evil men swallow up those that are more righteous than themselves? Elijah asked, Oh Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And Jesus even asked at the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You need to know that you're not the first to ask that question. <laughs> As a matter of fact, every honest Christian at some point in their lives has raised the question concerning the prosperity of the wicked and the seeming absence of God. Lord, I'm here trying to serve you. I pray every day. I try to live right. And then when I look across the street, there's that godless person with a foul mouth who seems to be prospering every day. Here I am struggling. I've got more month than I have money. It just seemed like the wicked prosper more than the righteous. Yes. So not only do we have doubt that originates from the observations of life, but secondly, confusion opens the door to temptation. He says, it was because of my confusion, as I examined the prosperity of the wicked, my feet almost stumbled. Yeah. I almost slipped. Oh I was envious of the foolish. Right. I saw their prosperity. Yeah. They seemed to have no problem, no pain. No trouble as they wore pride as a necklace. Confusion opens the door to temptation. The song here expresses the envy what was in his heart. And God knew that he was talking foolishly. Yeah. He knew that eventually he'd be ashamed of and embarrassed of what he said. That's why you gotta be careful what you say during your time of frustration and doubt. Because when God comes back to fix it, you may be ashamed of what you say and discover just how wrong you really are. The devil will slither up to you while you're in your state of confusion. He'll open the door of temptation and cause you to go on record by saying some things you wish you'd never say. So the Lord had Asaph rattled on about the prosperity of the wicked. He talked about their false pride and kept raging over their blasphemy. He voiced his dissatisfaction with what appeared to be their immunity to sickness, sorrow, and disappointment. It got so bad that his anger got intense. Mm -hmm. The more he talked about it, his tongue became unbridled, mm -hmm. and he accused God of being unfair. And one of the things we need to be careful of is making false accusations against God. Yeah. If Asaph were in our day, he would have closed up his Bible. He'd refuse to read the word anymore. No doubt he would stack his hymn book up on the top shelf. He'd no longer sing songs of time. He'd lock away his instrument in some closet. He'd resign from being the praise team leader. He'd resign his position as the minister of music at the church. He'd go home and sit down and start nursing his complaints against God. One writer said he'd bathe his soul in the water of bitterness. And for those of you here today, what are you bitter about? What have you allowed in your life to make you mad? 
And the fact of the matter is, no one or nothing makes you mad. That's right. Now we say he made me mad or she made me mad, but really we choose to be mad. Okay. And most times we're mad because it's something we can't control. Right. And since I can't control it, I just be mad. Yeah. And in the meantime, I'm gonna try to make you mad so we can both be miserable together. Asaph's yeah. problem was with the wicked. He couldn't control what was going on in their lives. And if we're not careful, the devil will create more confusion by telling you that you're better off. You were better off before you were a Christian. Uh, he'll tell you that lie. A lot of people will believe it and want to go back to Egypt like the children of Israel did. He'll try to convince you that you don't deserve to suffer. He'll whisper to you that if every day with Jesus is supposed to be sweeter than the day before, then why are you so bitter? He'll get you all worked up through temptation. He'll blind you to the consequences. Uh, you do know the temptation is like a rose. The devil will show you the beauty, but he'll cover up the thorns. Just like the other week. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had some roses back there for Donna. And when I get, went to get them, he handed them to me and I grabbed them. The thorns were covered. But the blood, like I said, still worked. <laughs> He'll show you a sin, but he'll hide the consequence. He won't tell you to do certain things that are right, but he'll always tell you to do things that are wrong. Yeah. He wants you to lose your family. He wants you to take that crack in heroin so you can lose your mind. Wow. He won't show you the consequences of your action, but, but he'll blind you because temptation has a way of knocking us off balance. Yes, sir. Sin will distort your thinking. Yes, right. Sin will have you saying, if it feels good, do it. Uh, that song by Luther Ingram back in the day, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Sin can distort your thinking so bad that you won't even try to do right. The day will come that if you stay in sin, uh, you won't be able to determine right from wrong. And that's where Asaph was headed until he went to church. Verses 16 and 17 again says, uh, so I try to understand why the wicked prosper. Yes, sir. But what a difficult task it is. Yeah. Then I went to the sanctuary. Oh, God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. When he went to church, something happened. He had almost lost his faith. Well. He could have been critical like others who are still mad at God because their mother died or their father right. left them at an early age. Right. But there's a solution in the sanctuary. Amen. Thank God for the sanctuary. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm glad that I can say today, I was glad when they said unto me, yes. let us go into the house of the Lord. Yes. The reason you ought to be glad is that sure-footedness comes as a result of you receiving his word. Yes. Because it's in the sanctuary that you get to hear the other side of life. Yes. All we long from Monday through Saturday, we yes. hear yes. man's side. Yeah. From Monday through Saturday, you hear that you're somebody if you have money. Yeah. From Monday through Saturday, you hear that you're somebody if you have clothes, cars, or a cottage in the country. Yeah. But on Sunday, yeah. you hear the other side of life. <laughs> on Sunday, you hear, whosoever will, let him come. All right. All right. On Sunday, you hear, come unto me, all ye that labor, yeah. and I'm heavy labor, yeah. and I'll give you rest. Yeah. Yes, on Sunday. Yeah. In the sanctuary, you hear the other side of life. Yeah. The world are trying to tell you there is no God. But in the sanctuary, you hear great is thy faithfulness. Yeah. In the world, we're told to hate those who hate us. Yeah. Curse those who curse us. Yeah. Fight those who fight us. Yeah. Gossip about those who gossip about us. Yeah. But in the sanctuary, yeah. we're told to do good to those who spitefully yeah. do good. Yeah. Bless yeah. those who curse you. Be kind to one another, forgiving them as Christ has forgiven us. And if we just understand that love covers a multitude of sin. And one day on Calvary's mountain, the love of Jesus covered a multitude of sin. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were weak and undone. And all we could do to the table, all we could bring to the table rather was a plate full of sin. Uh, we had no bargaining position. 
who had no room to negotiate. But God went on and demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were innocent, Christ died for us. Don't let your feet slip off into eternal destruction. We see the end of the wicked. But you don't have to have the same end as the wicked. Just come to Jesus right now. Amen. He'll give you joy and he'll give you hope. Yes, sir. Yes, he'll give you yes, peace. Sir. He'll give you life eternal. He died for our sins, but he rose for our salvation. Yes. And then when you give your life to him, you can enjoy fellowship in the sanctuary. You can hear songs of praise in the sanctuary. Yes. You can greet other saints of God in the sanctuary. Yes, sir. You can pray to the Father in the sanctuary. You can hear his word in the sanctuary. You can worship the Lord in spirit and in truth in the sanctuary. You get a new perspective. You get a new purpose. You get a new sense of his presence. You will experience his power. But you got to come on in to the sanctuary. Come on to the sanctuary. And when you come, you don't have to worry about slipping. You don't have to worry about stumbling or sliding. Because he is a God who can stabilize your steps. Amen. No wonder the psalmist says, order my steps. Yes. In your word, dear Lord. Word. Because he can order our steps. Yes, and when he orders our steps, if we do get tripped up, he's able to keep us from falling. Yes. If you get pushed down, he's able to pick you up. Yes. If they try to bury you, he is a resurrection expert. Yes. Uh, he knows something about being buried and then raising again. Yes. Because he was on Sunday morning, yeah. on the other side of the story, yeah. that he rose from the dead yeah. with all power in his hand. Yeah. Jew said, now unto him, yeah. was able to keep you yeah. from falling, yeah. and to prevent you faultless before the presence yeah. of his glory with exceeding joy. Yeah. So not only does he keep me from falling, but he can present me faultless yeah. in spite of my dirt and filth. Yeah. In spite of my sin and wrong, all that I've done wrong, he presents me faultless because he's able. He's able to present me with a clean slate, without a blemish, because his blood covered it all up. Thank God for his cleansing blood. Thank God for his washing blood. Thank God for his rinsing blood. Thank God for his saving blood. Because of his blood, he can present me faultless. Because of his blood, I don't have to worry about slipping in life. Because of his blood, I have a stable faith in slippery times. Thank God for his blood. God bless you.